Hello and welcome to Money Trail with me, Amir Arfa. Today, the International Banking Cartel, Part 2. But first, a quick look at Part 1. The four horsemen of banking, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, own the four horsemen of oil, Exxon Mobil, Royal Dutch Shell, BP, and Chevron Texaco. In tandem with Deutsche Bank, BMP, Barclays, and other European old money behemoths, but their monopoly over the global economy does not end at the edge of the oil patch. According to company 10K filings to the SEC, the four horsemen of banking are among the top 10 stockholders of virtually every Fortune 500 corporation. The fact is 52% of the New York Fed is owned by these eight families. It's the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, Goldman Sachs, Lehman's, Lazard's, Warburg's, Kuhn Loeb's, and Israel Moses Seif's. We have the Royal Bank of Scotland, we have HSBC, that's the old Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. Lloyds Bank, TSB, that has absorbed HBOS, Building Society. Uh, that uh, is followed then by Bank of America, Citigroup, JP Morgan Chase, UBS, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank and Westdeutsche Landesbank of Germany, Societe Generale of France, the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UJF, Norin Chukin of Japan, Royal Bank of Canada, and Rabobank of the Netherlands. Now that group, 15, 16 banks, that is essentially the heart of the cartel. Basically, it's like these, these families are running this printing press and they get countries in debt, they get individuals in debt, they get companies in debt, and when those people go into debt, and can't pay their loans back, then these bankers come in and seize the real asset. The Bank for International Settlements is the most powerful bank in the world, a global central bank for the eight families who control the private central banks of almost all Western and developing nations. The Bank for International Settlements is owned by the Federal Reserve, Bank of England, Bank of Italy, Bank of Canada, Swiss National Bank, Niederlandsche Bank, Bundesbank, and Bank of France. The central banks of the world, from the United States to Russia to China, they all operate under Basel III. Historian Carol Quigley wrote in his epic book Tragedy and Hope the Bank for International Settlements was part of a plan to, quote, create a world system of financial control and private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements. Naturally, it's, just, it's a sinister institution, right? Secretive, wealthy, uh, with no accountability, no transparency, no TV cameras, no nothing, all secret. Uh, this is the kind of thing that would have to end. Speaking of the international banking cartel, where does the U.S. Federal Reserve stand? How did it come to being? By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few private bank systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking corporate worlds were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, and the Rothschilds. In the early 1900s, they sought again to publish legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and the public were wary of such institutions, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. In 1907, J.P. Morgan published rumors that the Knickerbocker Trust Company was insolvent. This was a deliberate act of market manipulation which precipitated the panic of 1907. This led to an eruption of bankruptcies, repossessions, and failures. Unaware of the fraud, the panic led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich. Aldrich had intimate ties to the banking cartels, and he was the insider the banking cartels desperately needed. The commission led by Aldrich recommended a central bank should be implemented so the panic of 1907 would never happen again. This was the jumpstart the international bankers needed. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at the J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. During the 1910 Jekyll Island meeting, it was the Morgan Rothschild Rockefeller Alliance, and they worked closely throughout uh, the late 1800s, uh, right through uh, the 1910-1915 period. 
Um, so they were dominant in that day and age. Those three, those were the three major banking families. It was there that the central banking bill, called the Federal Reserve Act, was drafted. The bill was written by bankers for bankers. The meeting was held in complete secrecy. After the bill was constructed, it was then handed to their political spokesperson, Senator Nelson Ulrich, and he pushed it through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, while the majority of Congress was away for the holidays, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in and President Wilson signed it into law. Starting with 1913 and the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, we have privately owned central banks whose sole mission is to disguise themselves as operating in the public interest, when in fact they operate strictly in the interest of the member banks, the member private commercial banks. So we have this uh, giant veneer of a deception going on, and that is the main problem. Uh, if we actually had central banks that were operating in the public interest, producing uh, uh, national currencies in the public interest, uh, uh, and we did not have the specter of private commercial banks being able to counterfeit the national money through fractional reserve lending, uh, everybody would be a lot better off. The public was told that the Federal Reserve System would give them financial stability. As history has shown, nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to carry out their private agendas. For example, between 1914 and 1919, the Fed doubled the money supply, which led to extensive loans to small businesses and the public. Then in 1920, the Fed called in the remaining outstanding money supply, which resulted in panic and loans being called in. This led to bank runs and bank failures. Over 5,400 competitive banks, not within the Federal Reserve banking system, collapsed. The Fed sucked these banks up in a hurry, furthering their sphere of influence and power. Charles Lindbergh had stepped up and said after the creation of the Federal Reserve, from now on, depressions will be scientifically created. And as we shall see, this statement was more prophetic than arbitrary. Now the big bankers were just getting warmed up and they had a bigger plan to unveil on the American people. Between 1921 and 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply by over 60%, which once again led to extensive loans to the public, companies, and banks. There was also a new concept called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, a margin loan would allow an investor to buy a stock with only 10% down. The remainder of the stock would be carried by the broker. In other words, I could buy $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This was very popular during the Roaring Twenties and everyone seemed to be making money, lots of money. However, there was a catch to this loan. When the stock dips below a certain level, the balance could be called in and must be paid within 24 hours. This is called a margin call, which usually resulted in the selling of the stock to cover the outstanding loan and whatever the investor had put into the market was lost if he or she could not meet the margin. So a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller and the other banking insiders quietly exited the market, and on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in. This sparked an instant massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It caused runs on banks, which caused the collapse of over 16,000 banks. These international bankers were not only able to suck up these independent rival banks, but also whole corporations for pennies on the dollars. It was the biggest robbery in U.S. history. We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, here and after called the Fed. They are not government institutions. They are private monopolies which prey upon the people of the United States for the benefit of themselves and their foreign customers. The Federal Reserve is bad 
because of what it does, but what it does is influenced by the fact that it's privately owned. It needs to be nationalized. And this is the heart of my program. Federalize the Fed, nationalize it, seize it, deprivatize it, uh, take it over in whole or in part. It didn't stop there. Instead of expanding the money supply, the Fed actually contracted the money supply, fueling the largest depression in U.S. history. Once again outraged by the acts of the Fed, Lewis McFadden brought about impeachment hearings against President Herbert Hoover, and he also introduced a resolution bringing conspiracy charges against the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, saying that the crash of 1929 and the following depression was a carefully contrived occurrence. Are you going to let these thieves get off scot-free? Is there one law for the looter who drives up to the door of the United States Treasury in his limousine and another for the United States veterans who are sleeping on the floor of a dilapidated house on the outskirts of Washington? Not surprising, after two failed attempts, Lewis McFadden was assassinated by means of poisoning at a banquet in 1936. So having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve decided it was time to strip the people of all their remaining wealth. So under the pretense of ending the Depression came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in the United States had to turn in their gold coins, bullion, and gold certificates. And by the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished and the people received a Federal Reserve note which is not backed by anything. Before 1933, the dollar stated it was redeemable in gold. After 1933, it is just legal tender. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives it value is the amount of notes in circulation. Abracadabra, how the Fed creates money out of thin air. The central bank is an institution that produces a currency for an entire country. Two powers are inherent in central banking practices. Number one, they control the interest rates, and number two, they control the money supply and inflation. The central bank does not print the money supply and hand it over to the country. Instead, the central bank prints the money and loans it to the country at interest. Then through increasing and decreasing the money supply, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the long-term product of the central banking system is debt. We don't print money here in this country. We borrow every penny of it, with the exception of coin monies, which is a very small percentage. The problem is that we are we're, the national debt, which is our national money, every bit of it is borrowed uh, into existence primarily from commercial banks. It doesn't take a genius to figure out this Ponzi scheme. First of all, the United States does not print or own any of these Federal Reserve notes you may have in your wallet. Every single dollar printed is loaned to us at interest. This means that every single dollar printed already has a certain percentage of debt attached to it. Every penny in existence on your online banking has been created as debt, and that's got to be matched up with somebody else who's taking on the debt. And most of that has been done through people taking on mortgages and people taking on credit cards. And therefore, when we're telling people that they've been reckless spending, foolish borrowing, we're actually also relying on them for the creation of our nation's money supply. Um, so the people that tend to be in credit that are holding the assets tend to be the wealthy people. Um, and the people that are in the hole, that are in the debt, and the subprime borrowers um, and ordinary people. And that's why we're getting this massive divide between the people that are in debt that can't access any of the assets that are required to build wealth. Um, who are, and then you've got the people, the, the, you know, the 1%, which are acquiring most of the assets, have the balance. And every balance in their account is associated with the poor people's debt. So all this borrowing and all this printing has led to over $16 trillion of U.S. federal debt. So who are the debtors and who are the creditors? And what are the long-term, medium-term, short-term consequences of this debt? 
Sixty percent of government debt is purchased by banks and uh, related industries. So uh, they own the majority of the debt and certainly controlling interest of the debt. And thereby, they control the political process as well. Well, the debt that the government are taking on right now, we need to stop pretending that it's ever going to be repaid. Um, the reality is that if you want to continue uh, growing our economy um, in the existing infrastructure that we've created in our banking system, then debt has to increase um, and it will increase forever in order to drive growth. Um, the challenge is that if we, if we just simply say the government need to pay off their debt, when the government pay off their debt, unfortunately, you're getting a massive reduction in the money supply, um, which is a, a, you know, a disaster for the economy. Um, however, continuing this system is just as big a disaster um, because eventually you're going to end up with situations where people have less faith in the government. Therefore, you get a credit rating downgrade, as we've, as we've recently seen with government debt. Um, and a credit rating downgrade is an appetite that people are less willing to lend to the government. Um, and when people are less willing to enter the go to the government, you end up in this Ponzi scheme. Uh, the American people need to uh, perhaps take to the streets uh, chanting no more national debt. You don't have to run a nation on debt. You don't have to have a national debt. Ne it's the most important uh, responsibility and power of a sovereign nation to create its own money in the public interest. If you go out and ask the average uh, citizen on the street who creates the money in the country, they will inevitably answer the government. They, they say that because they intuitively know that that is government's most important responsibility. And yet, in virtually no nation on earth is that the case. Since the central bank has a monopoly on the production of the currency being issued, and they loan each dollar with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money come from to pay off the debt? The answer is simple. It can only come from the central bank. They just print more money. If a president wants to stimulate the economy by infusing $700 billion into the economy, or he wants to pay $800 billion for a universal health care system, well, the president can't reach into the congressional pocketbook because they are already in debt over their heads. So instead, they request that the Federal Reserve print the $700 or $800 billion they need. But the Federal Reserve doesn't just print the money free of charge. Instead, they add on or print extra to cover the percentage for services rendered, and they pocket the excess. Quantitative easing, that's the technical buzzword for printing more and more money. We've had QE1, QE2, and now QE3 to the tune of $40 billion a month. Q1, Q3, all it is, all it is, is sinking the United States of America further into debt. The only people it does any good is the, the traders on Wall Street, same banks, because they can take that zero interest money that they're being given and they can put it into, guess what, oil futures and, you know, corn futures. And you wonder why you're paying more at the store and you wonder why you're paying more at the gas station. We've reached a point in, in world history that we've never reached before. We've reached debt saturation. Uh, and what that means is that uh, further quantitative easing, in other words, just merely dumping hot money uh, into the top of the system instead of the bottom, into the top, the financial sector, uh, is now no longer producing an increase in GDP. For the first time in world history, it's actually depressing GDP. But hey, guess what? They're, they're a one-trick pony. That's the only trick they know because they are trapped in the debt money box. Uh, so um, we're, we're doomed to uh, a slow spiraling uh, uh, depression and uh, there's nothing that can be done until uh, the next big tip over in the stock market and then people in the United States at least will realize that the uh, answers that have been offered are not working and they're going to look elsewhere for something else. But exactly how federal is the U.S. Federal Reserve System? Once again, it is important to understand that the Federal Reserve is a private institution. As the well-known saying goes, it is as federal as Federal Express. It is a private bank that loans us a currency at interest. It is completely consistent with the banking model our founding fathers escaped from by declaring independence in the American Revolutionary War. 
I believe the banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Already they have raised up a moneyed aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The issuing power should be taken away from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Thomas Jefferson. Basically the only federal part of the Federal Reserve is the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And that is a board that's appointed by the, I guess it's the Treasury Department, yeah I believe it is, um, but anyway appointed by the administration. But they're all bankers, so you know the, the Federal Board of Governors is all bankers, they're all private bankers. Every other part of the Fed is private, and it's not some big conspiracy, it's just the facts. It's just, see, every bank in America has been sort of coaxed into this Federal Reserve system. So every, even your local banks, they're all part of it. They're all part of this Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve system is, of course, uh, illegal. It's unconstitutional because the Constitution gives the Congress the right and the responsibility to control money supply. They have given this over to the Federal Reserve, uh, that's bad enough, but then some of the people voting in the Federal Open Market Committee are from the branches, the Chicago, uh, San Francisco, uh, St. Louis, right? other, other uh, Federal Reserve branches, and those are just private bankers. They've never been approved by the Senate. They've never been appointed by the President. So this is completely uh, lawless. It means that private interests have taken over government function. So who watches the Federal Reserve System and its member banks? Regardless of whatever is written in code, the Federal Reserve really has no oversight and they are not really bound by a checks and balance system like the three branches of our government. So without audits, it's impossible to know how much the Federal Reserve is actually printing, who they are loaning it to, and any potential conflicts of interest. Henry Ford said about the Federal Reserve, it is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. In front of a session of Congress, uh, the President and Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank have stated to, to members of Congress that, that they're not even going to tell them how many trillions of dollars were lent out during a short period of time. They're not going to tell them where the money went, what the interest was on the loan, or if it was a loan, what the collateral was on these multi-trillions of dollars. The power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power that can bring entire economies and societies to its knees. Give me the control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. Title 31 of the U.S. Code requires an annual physical inventory of our gold supply, but a complete audit was never done. So officially, nobody knows what has occurred for the last decades. After World War II, America had 70% of the world's supply of loose gold, but today we may have less than 7%. Senator Jesse Helms seemed to think that OPEC nations have our gold, while others believe that 70% of the world's gold supply is being held by the World Bank, which is dominated by the financial grip of the Rothschilds and Rockefellers. The Federal Reserve System has never been audited, and their meetings and minutes of those meetings are not open to the public. They have repelled all attempts to be audited. Arthur Burns, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that an audit would threaten the independence of the reserve. These banks need to be regulated. They cannot be regulated as long as government is borrowing money from them. And uh, nothing else matters until you fix those two problems. Banks should not be allowed to lend government's money. Banks should not be allowed to counterfeit the national money through fractional reserve lending. The people who are running the central banking cartel in the United States known as the Federal Reserve Bank, are guilty of treason. This is the law, and if the law is to be upheld, and it will be, that we must arrest the leaders of the Federal Reserve Banking System, the owners and the officers of the Federal Reserve Banking System. They violated Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Thank you for watching. Always follow the money trail with me, Amir Arfa.